Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise, and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in veils below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith, Faith is the victory. Faith. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us is love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on o'er every field. The faith by which they conquer death is still our shining shield. Faith, faith is the victory. Faith, faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find drawn up in dread array. Let tents of ease be left behind and onward to the fray. Salvation's helmet on each head with truth all gird about. The earth shall tremble neath our tread. And echo with our shout. Faith. Faith is the victory. Faith. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will vanquish all the hosts of night, in Jesus' conquering name. Faith, faith is the victory, faith, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Thank you for joining us again this Wednesday evening for our continued study in the book of Hebrews. As noted in our introductory material a couple of weeks ago, the book of Hebrews is one of the most unique books in all of the New Testament. It is a book that is very relevant to our situation in the world today when everywhere we turn there's opposition to our trying to live the Christian life. Oftentimes it's family and friends and society in general who is against us, which is exactly what these New Testament Christians, Jewish Christians, were facing in the first century. There was opposition from their family. There was opposition from society. And so it became very difficult for them to live the Christian life. And so the book of Hebrews was written to encourage them to stay faithful. And you and I, you and I need to hear that message today. So if you would, study with me today as we go through the second chapter of the book of Hebrews. Would you bow with me as we begin today in prayer? Our Holy Father, we thank you that we can study your word. We thank you for this, this great book of Hebrews that helps us to understand the situation that Jewish Christians were going through in the first century. How they were challenged in their faith and commitment to you. And how this book helps him to understand that there is only hope in Christ. That everything they left behind in Judaism certainly was worth the price that they paid in being a Christian. That Jesus paid the price for them, but they can be, be faithful to him as we can be faithful to the very end. So bless our study. Bless our efforts. Be with us in this world of sin, sickness, sorrow, and death. And help us to be faithful in all ways. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin by just reading through Hebrews chapter 2. So if you have your Bible open there, let's read together, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord 
and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels, but one testified in a certain place saying, What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for every man. For, for it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have, per have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise is shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had power of death, that is, the devil." and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted he is able to aid those who are tempted. We saw in chapter 1 what we call the, uh, the revelation of God in his Son. This is a part of that, that section of Scripture. Uh, Christ was in the beginning with God, uh, was involved in the creation of the world. Uh, and now we get to this second chapter, and there's really two truths that are, that are set forth as we continue in this chapter out of chapter 1. The first is that God now speaks through his son, Jesus. He established that in chapter 1. And the second is that Christ is superior to the angels in every possible way. We see that as we continue in this chapter. So I want us to look at each of these verses uh, and see exactly why the writer is saying what he says to these New Testament Jewish Christians and what applies to you and me even today. If you'll notice, verse 1 begins with the word, therefore. I had a, a, a good uh, friend who was a, uh, an elder in the church, and every time he would teach a Bible class and he'd run across that word, he'd say, the word therefore, it means what was said before Therefore, I say something else to you, or I add something else to that. And that's exactly what it means. Based upon what he already said, he's saying something else. That word is found 16 times in the book of Hebrews. And so the word therefore simply means that what has already been said is leading to something more. And so here we are in chapter 2. The something more is a warning. In other words, if those angels in what they did, what they said, proved to be true, then what Jesus says is even greater because he's superior to them in every possible way. In, in every possible way. And so Christ is superior to angels, and his word must be heard. Failure to do so will lead to apostasy. Drifting away is the term that is used, and that danger is always present. In verse 2, the word spoken through angels refers to the means by which the law of Moses had been given. You remember in, in Acts chapter 7, if you've studied that text, that Stephen, who was one of the, the very first martyrs uh, in the church, Christian martyrs, he was a preacher of the gospel, one of those seven who had been selected back in chapter 6 to serve the needs of the widows. When he was preaching in Jerusalem, this is in Acts chapter 7, 
In verses 52 and 53, he, he said this, they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you now have become, have become betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. So Stephen was referring back to how the law had been given and the angels were a part of that even in Moses' day. Galatians 3 and verse 19 says this, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. So angels participated in the bringing of God's word to people even through Moses in the Old Testament. And however the angels were involved in bringing uh, the word forth, the message was from God. We need to always remember that. No matter who the messenger might be, the message is always from God, biblically speaking. And those who disobeyed were at times severely punished, even put to death. And so this is something that is being warned about right here in the first couple of verses of Hebrews chapter 2. And so he goes on in verse 3, and he asks the question, well, how shall, we, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? See, this is coming back to, to these Jewish Christians who were wanting to walk away from their Christianity, thinking it's easier to live as a Jew than it is to try to live as a Christian. We need to keep in mind, again, that Jesus is superior to the angels. And so if the word that they spoke, which we've already shown through the Old Testament, in the Old Testament came through them to Moses and others. If, the, if what they spoke was, was to be feared and to be obeyed, the word of Jesus carries even more weight, eternal weight. These Jewish Christians knew the Old Testament. They knew those stories. They knew how God had dealt with their forefathers and their foremothers. They knew the stories of how God punished Israel for their transgressions. If they were going to neglect the salvation that's offered through Jesus Christ, then they were going to face even worse punishment than their forefathers did in the Old Testament. The words of Jesus were confirmed by the apostles who were eyewitnesses to what he said and to what he did. And even more convincing was the fact that God bore witness to Jesus' ministry with signs, wonders, miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Just read the Gospels. And, and see all the things that Jesus did. He healed every known disease, made the deaf to hear, the blind to see, the crippled to walk, even raised the dead. Jesus performed miracle after miracle after miracle to prove that he was from God and the apostles following him preached a message and used miracles to prove that they were bringing a message from God to the people in their day. In verses 5 through 8, we have a, a quotation starting in verse 6. It comes out of Psalm 8 in verses 4 through 6. But you recall back in chapter 1, verses 10 through 12, the, the writer there spoke of the created world, which will someday be destroyed. That's talking about the world that we live in, even the universe. It'll all change. Here, he speaks of that created world, which was witnessed by the angels. You see, they were there. They saw it. The, they witness God bringing it all into being. And so he's speaking of the, the created world, the angels witnessed, but never had authority over it. We need to keep that in mind. Angels never had any authority. They were ministers, as we saw in the last verse of chapter 1. Now, verses 6 through 8, first part of verse 8, comes from Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. We humans have been created lower than the angels. But we have received the providential care of God, something that they probably didn't have, or at least if they had it, they could have let go of it because we know Satan did because he was an angel and he left his estate and he was cast out of heaven. So the crowning with the glory and honor indicates the fact that we have been created in the image and in the likeness of God. You go back to Genesis chapter 1, and you see this in verses 26 and 27, where we were created in his image. We were created in his likeness. Set over the works of your hands means that God gave man dominion over all the world's creation. God gave mankind 
uh, power and, and control and dominion over the animals, the plants, the birds, the fish. You see, this is Genesis 1, 29 and 30. And even though man was created a little lower than the angels, they never had any rule, any authority or dominion over the created world. God gave that to mankind in the days of Adam, in the very beginning, when the, the days of creation uh, were involved. In the second part of verse 8, the writer explains to his readers that God placed the created world under the subjection and dominion of mankind, but <laughs> there's an explanation here because something happened that kind of changed that direction. That shift comes right here, indicating that even though the created world had been put under the the uh, dominion and the control of man, he in many ways let the created world take control of him. This is what happened when Eve was deceived by the serpent, Satan, and thus deceived her husband, and sin came into the world. And, and so that deception changed the whole process of how God had given dominion to man, but all of a sudden, Satan robbed man of that, bringing sin into the world. That brings us to verse 9, which says this, but we see Jesus. You see, this, this sinful world that Satan instituted by deceiving Eve and Adam and causing them to sin, bringing sin into the world, needed a Savior, needed a way to be forgiven, pardoned, have that sin taken away. And that's why verse 9 begins the way it does. We see Jesus made a little lower than the angels, meaning for a time he was in the flesh, a period of about 33 years. He was a little lower than the angels during that time. And in that time, he suffered death. He experienced the resurrection and became sin for sinful mankind. For example, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21 says, For he made him, that is God, made Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then the word propitiation comes into play here. We talked about it earlier in chapter 2. In 1 John 2 and verse 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins. Uh, propitiation means satisfaction that sin had been sufficiently punished. Found also in Romans 3.25 and here in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17. We'll get to that a little later. In verse 10, what about the one who created all things? The one who was in the beginning as God created us in his image, became fitting sacrifice, bringing us to glory. That's Christ. The one who was in the beginning as God, Christ, Elohim, Genesis 1-1, God, that Hebrew word, it's a plural word, including Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No other sacrifice could have possibly made us fit for eternal glory than the one that was made by Christ when he came here. The word captain is used in this verse and is translated as author of our salvation as in chapter 12 and verse two, the author and finisher of our faith. It indicates one who is a pathfinder or one who is a pioneer, one who leads the way, uh, leading the way, blazing the trail so we could find our way to heaven. He came, he led the way, he blazed the trail. Made perfect indicates his willingness to be tested, to be tried, to be humiliated, and to be killed without sinning so we could have our sins taken away. In other words, the perfect Son of God became the per people's perfect sacrifice, perfect Savior, opening up their way to God. Oh, we need to be so thankful for that and what he did, giving us the ability to be under the presence of God. In verse 11, both the sanctifier, that's Christ, and the sanctified, that's Christians, are of one. In other words, we belong together. It means that Christ became one with man. When he came here, he took on our likeness. He took our, on our image. He came to earth and lived as a man. He faced sin as we face sin. When we get to chapter 4, verse 15, we will see that, that he's that high priest, uh, though he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Matthew chapter 4, Satan tried to deceive him and tempt him. Tempt him. And in every case, he used scripture to defeat Satan's temptation uh, for him to sin. 
And then Jesus died as men will die. He was resurrected as we will be resurrected. And because he has so much in common with mankind, he's not ashamed to call us his brethren. Here's something that these Jewish Christians in the first century needed to think about. Because you see, they were, they were wanting to defect. Some of them were defecting. And, and even some of the defectors were probably uh, able to read some of these things that were, were being written to them. And what he's saying here is that Christ was not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, if Christ was not ashamed to call them brethren, then why were they ashamed to stand up for him, keep their commitment, remain faithful to him? It's something we need to think about as well. Christ is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Are we ashamed to call him our savior, our high priest, our brother, a co-heir, and the blessings that God has has for us when we get to heaven. Verse 12, this is a quote from Psalm 22 and verse 22, where Christ is praising God to his brethren in the midst of the assembly. And incidentally, Psalm 22 has no less than six prophecies of Christ. In fact, verse one, if you'll look at that, you will see it's a cry that we see, see Christ on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The point of this verse and the quotation from Psalm 22 shows how much Christ loves the church, how much he loves us, calls us brethren, not ashamed to confess us before God, the Father in heaven, lest we forget he in turn expects us to confess him before mankind. Matthew 10 verses 32 and 33 these are the words of Jesus. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. In verse 13, there are two quotations. The first is from 2 Samuel 22 and verse 3, where David praised God after being delivered uh, from the hand of his enemies and from the hand of Saul. It's quoted here to indicate the trust that Christ had that God would embrace any and all that Christ would embrace. Christ embraces us, God will embrace us. And so we need to understand that. The second quotation comes from Isaiah 8 and verse 18, where the people of Judah were embraced by God as his children, found here in Hebrews to indicate that Christ will stand before God to embrace us in his presence. First John 2 and verse 1 says this, my little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Oh, that's such a blessing to understand that, that Jesus stands before God on our behalf, our advocate as an attorney defending our case and our cause in the presence of God. Now, verse 14 just as children of God are partakers of flesh and blood, so also was Christ. He came here and, and he partook of everything we partake of in the way of human living and human uh, fleshly uh, needs and so forth. Uh, partakers of the flesh means that, that our nature is more than just the chemical elements of the world. Understand this. Uh, we were created by God from the dust of the earth. That is true. Go back to Genesis chapter 2 and you begin, be see that very clearly. And yes, our bodies are made up of earthly chemicals. Any chemist can take us apart piece by piece and, and find that we are made up of the chemicals of this world. And so that's who we are physically. And one of these days we'll return to the dust of the earth. But we are more than earthly chemicals and dust of the earth. We need to know that, understand that. I think some people forget or, or don't want to know or never did know that there's more to us than what meets the eye and what chemicals we're made up of in this world. Genesis 1:26, if you recall, in the days of creation, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. In verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Think about this. God created us in his image and in his likeness. Even though we're created out of the dust of the ground, 
God breathed into us the breath of life. He breathed some of himself into us. So we're more than chemicals and more than dust, more than earthly compounds. Man is the only being that God created into which he breathed the, the breath of life. He didn't breathe that into the birds, the fish, the beasts, the cattle, or any creeping thing, only in man. Now, yes, those others did, did live, did take on life in the days of creation, and they were able to breathe. But it's only man that God breathed himself, his life, into us. I want you to notice a passage found over in 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to turn back over there with me real quick. This is Paul explaining to the Corinthian church uh, some of the things concerning the resurrection, which some of them had a problem with and, and didn't really understand. Beginning in verse 50 of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul writes, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not, shall not all sleep. That means we may not all die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The second part of verse 14, we're back in Hebrews 2 right now. The second part of verse 14, again, explains the purpose of Christ coming in the flesh. Christ came here and became human like we are. He came to live as a human, came to suffer, came to die in order to destroy the one who brought death upon man in the first place, the devil. Satan deceived Eve and thus Adam, thus bringing death upon all men. Christ came to destroy that power. Verse 15 is a continuation of the reason Christ became flesh and died on the cross. So he could set us free from the bondage and the penalty of sin. In verse 16, we're back to angels again. Christ did not become flesh and die so he could give aid to angels. No, he did not do that. He didn't do what he did for their benefit at all. He did that for ours. By the way, angels can't die. They're eternal. They'll live eternally either in heaven or in hell. So Christ is not going to aid them. He aids us. Go back again to chapter 1 uh, and verse 14. But Christ came to give aid to what is spoken here as the seed of Abraham. Who would that be? Uh, go back to Galatians 3, if you would. Look at verses 26 through 29, where Paul there is explaining the seed of Abraham in this way. He says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You see, Abraham's seed are those who have been baptized into Christ Jesus through faith in him as the Son of God. In verse 17, here Christ is first revealed as our high priest. You see, all through the book of Hebrews, we're adding another dimension to who Christ is for us in the presence of God. And here it's revealed to us that he is our high priest. Now, again, Christ had to first become one of us. He had to be human. He had to be like his brethren. So then he could become a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. He understood us. He knows us. He knows our hurts. He knows our, our temptations. He knows our troubles. He knows our struggles in life. The high priest of Israel was selected from the tribe of Levi and from the family of Aaron, but they were all human. 
They understood human needs. They understood human weaknesses. They understood human frailties. And even they sinned and had to offer sacrifices for themselves before they could offer any sacrifice for the people that they represented in the presence of God. Now, Christ is our high priest. He understands our weaknesses. He was tempted. He shed tears. He needed rest. He got angry, but he didn't sin. Hebrews 4.15, again, tells us, tempted like we are, yet without sin. And again, we see the word propitiation. He took our place. He became sin for us when he was beaten, scourged, spit on, and crucified. God then was satisfied that sin had been sufficiently punished. That's what propitiation means. Sin is sufficiently punished in the mind and in the eyes of God. And finally, verse 18, he was tempted. Temptation was real to Jesus. I've had people try to tell me, well, it, it wasn't real. Those temptations that he faced with Satan, as recorded in Matthew 4, weren't real. Yes, they were. They were just as real as every temptation you face and every temptation I face. He understands our temptations and how real they are to us. He can be our advocate in the presence of God because he knows what we face in this life that is filled with sin, sickness, sorrow, and death. Hebrews 2 begins with a warning. Therefore, since the words of angels proved to be true and sin was punished, listen to Jesus because his word carries more weight. His words are eternal. God bore witness to him and to the apostles with various works and miracles and signs to prove him to be who he claimed to be. Humans were created lower than angels, but were given dominion over the created world. Angels were not. Christ, for a time, was himself made lower than the angels. When he came in the flesh, uh, but he was crowned with glory and honor by his resurrection and his final ascension back into heaven to be at the right hand of God. The bottom line in this chapter is that Christ came in the flesh to live like we live so he could become our savior and our high priest. He's tasted death for us. He was tempted like we are. Now he sits at the right hand of God to help us through our struggles and our trials in this life. The things that are found in this chapter, again, are those that were there to help these first century Jewish Christians understand you have everything you need to be in the presence of God in Christ. You didn't have that in the Old Testament. You didn't have that in Moses. You didn't have that in the law, but you have it in Christ. Don't give in and don't give up. Next week, we'll look at another therefore as we start into chapter three and consider even more about who Christ is. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, we, we thank you that we can call you our God. And we thank you that we can study your word. We can meditate upon the truths that are found in this great book of Hebrews. Help us to understand those deep truths and, and what Christ did for us and how he is our high priest and how he is our savior and how he is the only one who can stand before you on our behalf. Help us to appreciate that. Help us to be thankful for that. Now continue with us as we, as we continue through this time of struggle in this world to, to be faithful to you in every way and continue with us in our study of your word to be faithful in every way and forgive us when we fail. Through Jesus Christ we pray.